And so I think it was there almost three years and a sort of an overall food and beverage manager position came up. And so I applied for it thinking, okay, I've got this great record, right? My turnover was less than 2% in the three years that I was there. My operational numbers were amazing, right? And again, I was voted leader of the year. I thought, okay, yeah, I've totally got this in the bag. I didn't. Oh, no. So this is the story of my life. I got passed over again for a person who was younger than me with significantly less experience and a man. Oh, my goodness. Hey, fellow workers, my name is Kim Seaver. You're tuning into episode four of season three of the Alberta Worker Podcast. We are proud members of the Labor Radio Network and the Harbinger Media Network. We're broadcasting from the territory of the Nitsapi, and today's guest is Connie Holzer, an HR professional. Welcome, Connie, to our show. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me. You betcha. So we're just going to go straight into it and have you tell us your life story, you know, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, that sort of thing, and then also to share with us your personal labor history, your first job subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, and you know the path that you took to get there. And you can share those separately or at the same time, the floor is yours. For sure. So I grew up in rural Alberta, uh, just north of Edmonton in the West Lock Barhead area in a very ultra conservative religious family. Grew up going to 4-H and learning the basic fundamentals of farming and horseback riding. I raced horses for a while. And then when I graduated from high school, I went to Bible College in Camrose. My first job was actually when I was there. I worked at Tim Hortons back when the uniforms were burgundy and white and we made things in-house. <laughs> I was just about to ask that. Yeah, because my spouse back in the early 90s worked at Tim Hortons and they still had bakers and everything. Yeah, got to work at 4 a.m. and, you know, ice the donuts. And it was much different than it is now, for sure. Yeah, and then that kind of started my path into hospitality. So I worked at Tim Hortons. I worked at Robin's Donuts. And then I worked at a place in Camrose called the Old Cinema Dining and Lounge. It was quite revolutionary for the time. I'm not sure if it's still there. I haven't been to Camrose in a long time, but it had a really fancy restaurant upstairs. And then it was a party house downstairs. So my greatest memory there was when the Blue Jays won the World Series. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. In the 92 or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I remember that. And then I got married quite young, had a couple of kids, and then that relationship didn't really work out. So were you working while you were having children, raising children? Yeah. So back then we didn't get that one year off. We got 12 or 16 weeks off, I think, with my first one. So my first two are about a year apart, a little over a year apart. So yeah, 16 weeks. And then I went right back to serving in a dining room, and had my baby in daycare. And then my second baby came along and I stayed home a bit longer with the two of them. And then probably when they were about a year old, I went back to school and I went into human services. So back then it was called personal care aid. So working with people with disabilities or in seniors homes and things like that. I did that for a couple of years. Okay. I love technology. I still do. And I went to school because the personal care aid thing was okay, but it didn't pay great. And as a single mom, I was really struggling with finding something that I could get to pay my bills. Plus, I imagine like you gone all day looking after people and then you got to come home and look after people. Yeah, it was really taxing. And of course, I caught everything my kids caught. So I was always sick. Or if I didn't catch it from my kids, I caught it from the people I worked with. It was just for health. It was like a crazy challenging time. And so then I went back to school and I did something called network administration, which at the time, this was before Wi-Fi was a thing. Yeah, yeah. I learned the ins and outs of computer coding, Linux, things like that. And I did really well in it. I got a job with company, a subsidiary of Hewlett Packard, okay, where we develop policies for the first wireless hub uh -huh. back when it was, I think, 1.4 megahertz. It didn't have great range. People like to think they could put them in their basements. Never worked very well. <laughs> It didn't work very well through concrete walls. And so troubleshooting that quite a bit. And and I really love doing that, but I was only making about 40% of my male counterparts. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I mean, I was probably just as good at the job as they were. 
Right. The reason was they were like, well, you have kids. We don't know how long you'll be here. You know, who, when you're going to go off and have another baby. And I was like, oh, okay, like Nito. All the more reason to have more money. You have children. Right. <laughs> Oh my goodness. And in between there, I got remarried and my husband and I moved to Calgary for a short period of time. And he still works with people with disabilities for a nonprofit organization right now, has been with the same company now for, I think, 12 years. Okay. But when we were in Calgary, that's when I landed into retail because it was the early 2000s. And basically they were hiring warm bodies. They could, just couldn't find the people. So it was at a big box store and I did really well there. I found a niche for sales and leadership. They really spent a lot of time training us. They had their own sort of university that we would go and learn how to, you know, it was a, a hardware type store. So go in and learn how to do plumbing and uh, basic electrical and flooring. Sorry, my cat's like right here. Yeah, I see this blurry tail going back. The little tails is flowing back and forth, yeah. <laughs> They spent a lot of money on training. I really loved it. And then I had really good mentors who gave me some leadership training. And I ended up getting my first management position when I was there. And I did super well with this company. And in Calgary, I was there for about two and a half years. And then I got pregnant with my surprise fourth baby. And just the way the economy was going and housing, we were living in this wonderful farm house that we were renting. It got sold by a developer. So we kind of had to leave and no one would rent to us. So we had to move back to Edmonton. So I transferred with the same company back to Edmonton and a completely different story. And the difference between Edmonton and Calgary and the work environment is completely different. This is the same big box store? Yes. Really? But this the general worker attitude like so many people I know who worked in Edmonton and Calgary for the same company like it's so different while I had amazing success in Calgary it was a completely different story in Edmonton I mean I transferred back as a department manager I had the same position when I was in Calgary but they made it really hard for me it's kind of the same with the company I'm with now <laughs> but anyway in Calgary, it was a lot more of a collaborative teamwork environment. Everyone was a lot nicer to each other, I thought. But in Edmonton, when I came back, it was more like, you know, all for yourself, you know, and casualties are just a part of the culture. And it is, I would say, I've been back in Edmonton now for 17 years. And I can say from when I left that company to a couple others that I've worked for, it's very similar between Edmonton and Calgary. Really? The Calgary organizations are just much more collaborative. Hmm. I think because maybe Edmonton's more of a government town, more of a union town, whereas Calgary's not a government town. It's more of a blue collar kind of worker place. And so anyway, I stayed with that company for another two years. I had applied for a promotion and I was qualified for it. They gave it to a, a person with less experience than me because his wife had just had a baby and they were feeling sorry for him. I was just about to ask if he was a man. I have four kids and they're like, yeah. So that really left a bad taste in my mouth. You can never win. That other employer didn't want to give you more money because they were afraid you could have kids. And then this company is giving promotions to people who have been children. Yeah. And when you have any number of kids, and I know you have a few yourself, that it really falls on the mom to pick up the slack. And my husband and I have always been very collaborative. You know, we take turns taking the kids to the doctor or so our third child is autistic and we went through our highs and lows with him. And so whether it was a school meeting or a doctor's appointment or a specialist appointment, we always took turns and we were able to book things far enough in advance. And he never got any flack for it. I always thought like, oh, really? Like another one? And it's like, well, I don't do all of them kind of thing, right? So that part was a challenge as well. And then just parenting a kid with special needs in this day age finding accommodation from any workplace and they're like oh really like you know other people have kids why do we have to accommodate you and it's right I'm not asking really for a big accommodation I'm just like can I bank time can I take a day off you know what can I do plan my life around this so and he was diagnosed really early he was two and he's 21 now oh wow and then our fourth one has her own learning differences as well and is this son of yours still living at home he does live at home. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. That's a whole different conversation. 
Yeah. But there's no way he could live on its own. Right. He's on each, but we subsidize him quite a bit just because of the things that he needs and does and whatnot. But that's a whole different conversation, like I said. Challenges of parenting and then having a job. So I left and then I went to Safeway and I stayed with them for probably about six years. I worked in the Starbucks as an operator and I also did quite well there. I was moved around quite a bit to train operators, keep the Starbucks to standard all over the province. So Hinton, Fort Mac, they sent me everywhere. And then my district manager was retiring. And at this point, I'd been there five years. So I applied for the position. And then the SoBe's takeover happened and they put somebody else in that role. Oh my goodness. Yeah. You just can't get a break. No. Well, and also not a female. It was a man. Of course. Of course. With zero coffee experience. <laughs> oh my goodness. So employed with Safeway or with Starbucks? So the Starbucks inside of Safeways yeah. were called licensed Starbucks. So Safeway paid Starbucks a licensing fee to have them in their stores. But they're Safeway employees. We answered to both Starbucks and Safeway, but Safeway was our employer. Right. So within the Safeway realm, the district manager, like I said, I applied for her role, very qualified. I mean, I was their district trainer, basically. But like I said, the Sobeys buyout of the Canadian division for Safeway happened and they just, they put their own person in there who had no coffee experience. Right. So was the district manager position like overseeing all the Starbuckses? Yeah, it was all of Alberta. Oh, okay. All right. Now, I mean, most of them are gone. So, I mean, it is what it is. But again, it was a, a I could catch a break, right? And at that point, my oldest kids were in high school and we had pretty good support with our younger kids. So I felt like that was something I could do. Like I never apply for anything I know I can't do. And so then that didn't really work out after Safeway. I went back to my first love of hospitality. There was a few other things I tried in there that didn't last very long. I was really just really frustrated with not being able to find a way to advance past a certain amount of money per year and be able to use my experience. So I went back to hospitality just because I had that Starbucks experience. So the Grand Villa Casino downtown Edmonton, they opened up and they had what they call quick serve restaurants in there. So I managed those and then their main floor. I was voted leader of the year. I did really well. Food and beverage is kind of my passion. I love cooking and that mixology piece and just the overall customer service part. And I just really, really enjoyed doing it and I had a staff of like 120 people I had an assistant manager with me and it was just really a new that's like that operational piece is really what I loved and so I think I was there almost three years and a sort of an overall food and beverage manager position came up and so I applied for it thinking okay I've got this great record right my turnover was less than two percent in the three years that I was there my operational numbers were amazing, right? And again, I was voted leader of the year. I thought, okay, yeah, I've totally got this in the bag. I didn't. Oh, no. So this is the story of my life. I got passed over again for a person who was younger than me with significantly less experience and a man. Oh, my goodness. And then... Basically, that person worked really hard to make my life as difficult as possible. Really? So he, he's your boss now? He was my boss, yes. Oh, no. So he hated everything I did. Oh, my goodness. He was incredibly critical of every process I had in place. And that was a unionized environment. And so we had really strict things that we had to follow, like rules we had to follow to ensure that we were compliant with the union. He didn't understand those rules. Whenever the union came after him, he would put it back on me. And I'd be like, I, I mean, I know what the rules are. And so I'm following them. I don't want to sound too evasive, but for example, scheduling was really specific. So with all 120 people, we had to have schedules up two weeks out all the time. Right. And I created a fair rotation for all of the staff so that people weren't 
getting, you know, the good shifts all the time or also falling in line with the seniority rules and things like that. But just making sure that everyone got a fair shake, especially on Oilers games nights. Like those were good money making nights for some of those people. So I wanted to make sure that everyone had the best opportunity without breaking any rules. Of course. And then he decided to change it all. And and of course, the girls were like, what's going on? And anyway, he just made things incredibly difficult for my success. Um, uh, I don't know if he felt threatened by the fact that I was able to do, well, I was really doing his job before he got there. I'm not in control of who chooses to hire who and when. And of course, I really liked my job. So I just kind of stayed put and with grace, I did what I needed to do and but I'm not a good subordinate when it comes to a micromanager. I will be absolutely honest on that, especially when I had so much autonomy to how I did things prior to. So yeah, that happened there. So I obviously didn't last very long in that situation. And then I moved to another casino group. It was kind of far from my house. I like to work closer to home. I loved working in the casinos and all of the excitement that goes with it. But this particular casino group, I just couldn't get something closer to home. And I didn't leave them high and dry, waited till the Kentucky Derby was over. But I had run into someone who used to work for me and they managed a different entertainment center. And it was a smaller scale and smaller staff and really close to home. And I was like, perfect. And so I was there for about six months and then COVID hit. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, like all of us in hospitality and entertainment, we all got laid off. Yeah. And then I went back for the short period that we were able to go back again. I really liked it there. It was good. The good boss, good people. And then they were shut down again. And then uh, they restructured and eliminated my position. Oh, for Pete's sake. Man, you've had a rough run. Oh, yeah. So while I was off on COVID, I thought, what sort of job could I get that can't be replaced by AI or digitization, you know, that I would be good at? And so just with some consultation with some friends and mentors, they suggested that I go to school and get my HR diploma. Okay. So that's what I did during COVID. Got my HR diploma. I mean... I don't know what I thought when I was done school that I would magically get this job that, you know, would pay like a ton of money. I don't necessarily think I had that illusion. But when I did the research prior to taking the course, the pay was probably for an HR assistant, even $50,000 a year. And I could live with that. Right. It would be a bit of a pay cut, but whatever. Sure. We all adjust. It's still decent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then when I was done school, an HR assistant pay dropped to $40,000 a year. Mm. I was like, I can't do that. Like, that's really unacceptable. So I thought, well, I'll just go back to hospitality. It's what I'm good at. And those were few and far between. And then I ran into a situation where I was really qualified for the job. But I kept getting passed over for younger, less experienced people, and usually men. I even had a few companies call me back three or four months after and be like, hey, you still looking for work? And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, why would you try this little experiment and then call me back? I have my own personal pride and dignity and whatever. And I was in an okay place at the time. So I was like, no, I'm good. So I got a job with a fairly well-renowned big box store global organization it pays really good okay. great benefits but then we have this wave of every company needs to get on board and fulfill the diversity equality and inclusion pieces of that right i'm all for diversity, equality, and inclusion. But my greatest wish is that resumes didn't have names on them. If that interviews were done blind and that it was based mostly on merit and personality, but through maybe a filter so that they can't hear your voice. I don't know. I feel like there's a wave now of a different sort of challenge when it comes to finding work and companies don't seem to find a value in the older worker and they don't seem to want to invest in those older workers. Yeah. Oh, like yes. I still have a good 10 to 15 years before I could technically retire, Yep. but they don't see any value in that. The current organization I'm with, 
I've applied internally for three positions and have been rejected by all of them. The job I have is far too easy for me, I guess is the way I could put it. It's not very challenging. Yeah, it isn't challenging at all. Most people who have the role across the organization, they take the full 40 hours a week. And I struggle to fill my week because all of the tasks that are involved, I get done within two and a half days. Okay. I started asking to do extra projects and things like that. I also, I forgot to mention, I guess two barriers that I deal with. The biggest one actually is ability. So physical ability. I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia about 30 years ago. Oh, wow. I've been able to manage it quite fine. I know what my triggers are. I know what I need to do to mitigate flares and things like that. As I get older, weather is like my biggest trigger for some of the things that are involved with that. Right. When I first started at the company I'm with now, I had a really understanding female boss. As long as I was transparent with her and let her know, I really had liberties as to what I could and couldn't do. But there was going to sit in a room that was dark or if I was light sensitive that day or I had a heated blanket I used to bring because I get so cold or I could work from home if I needed to maybe take a little longer to get my day started, but I had a work laptop and 90% of my job I could do from home. I was good. I was able to manage my disease just fine. And then last fall, they took away those liberties and said, if you don't feel good, stay home from work and use your sick days. And I was like, but I'm not sick. Yeah. I've been allowed and they're like, well, things have changed and we can't allow this for you anymore. In that meantime, I, I did get a new boss as well. Man. Yep. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Heck? And I had also applied for that position. Of course. Yeah, I didn't get it. Oh my goodness. The other role I had applied for was within the food and beverage capacity of that business. Okay. Like I'm wildly capable and qualified. Yeah. yeah. And they chose to hire a man. Oh my goodness. The new boss decided that because I had asked for accommodation for my disease that I wouldn't be able to manage that business. Like they decided for me what I can and can't do. Right. Which was incredibly frustrating. And discriminatory. Well, I find it to be very ableist. Sure. And yeah, discriminatory. But if you use those words, they get offended. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Anyway, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that goes on with that. So as a result of those changes in policy, I'm actually off work right now because they changed those policies during that polar vortex. I ended up taking pain medication that I normally take as needed, like once in a while, and it just ended up wrecking my tummy. So I had to take oh. some time off to get that fixed and then well, let it heal. And then we kind of have to decide from there what we're going to do. But anyways, the journey along the way. So my work journey has been incredibly challenging. I've glossed over a lot of the details. I've always tried to just do better and be better. And then just sources outside of my control have kind of been barriers to my success. Sure. Whether it be, you know, younger less experienced equals cheaper doesn't necessarily make it a better business decision. I don't know. I don't own a business, but I think sometimes if you have someone in place that's already done the work, it may, makes sense to kind of keep them around. But yeah, they have all that experience and skill set and every knowledge. Yeah, totally agree with you. Yeah. So and the HR part is really fascinating because I actually was able to firm up some legislation. I always knew that as a salaried manager or a salaried worker in Alberta, we actually have the least amount of rights as far as hours of work go. Right. There's not really a whole lot of protection in place because you have to prove how many hours you work. Or I worked in a salaried role where I've not gotten stat pay or never over time because you're salaried, right? I would say that in Alberta, we have probably some of the worst labor laws in the country. Oh, absolutely. Just based on what I've learned and then even the ways that the Alberta government quietly changes laws and never says anything. The most recent one was bereavement days. So you used to be able to get one bereavement day for you know, three bereavement days, I think it was, and one of them had to be paid. And now no employer is required to do that at all. I think it's one bereavement day a year maximum, but they don't have to pay you for it. Maximum? What's the minimum? Oh, don't go. 
right? Yeah, and most people would choose not to go if they can't get paid, right? Like people just can't afford one day off and not everybody gets things like paid time off or wellness days or they don't have a benefit structure that covers those things. So it's really hard. And just from what I hear on the ground, like people who are moving here from other provinces due to the wonderful ad campaign our tax dollars are paying for. Yeah. None of that tells them the quiet part out loud. And so when those people get here, they're like, what do you mean I don't get paid for those days? What do you yeah. mean I don't get stat pay? Or you mean if I don't work the last 13, nine Mondays or whatever, I don't get a stat day? It's so anti-employee. It's ridiculous. I mean, speaking of all those people who are moving here, this is going to come out later in the summer, but we're recording this mid-May and I wrote an article about uh, April's job stats. We got an increase of several thousand new jobs, but our labor force increased significantly mm -hmm. in the same month. And so our unemployment rate jumped up to the highs it's been in like over two years. So and it's all part-time jobs too. It is. And if you talk to, again, the people on the ground, it's quite fascinating how disillusioned they are and how little they know about what their options are. And our provincial government, uh, and now we're the lowest paid minimum wage in the country. I think we're tied to the lowest now. And then Saskatchewan bumps up later this year. Oh, uh, on July 1st, right? Oh, maybe. I don't remember the exact date. I just remember it's not quite there yet. But I think we're tied with Saskatchewan right now. It's very close. Yeah. Like, and then all they're worried about is competition with other jurisdictions. Yeah, let's pay people the lowest and uh, hope for the best. Yeah, it's brutal out there. And the company I work for is amazing. And I, I kind of wish I could, you know, maybe work for it in a different city. <laughs> The market out there is is brutal. Like I've been looking for the last four months for something comparable. I'm even willing to take a small pay cut. But at the end of the day, friends of mine are like, just start your own business. And I'm like, I'm doing what? <laughs> anyway, so that's a different journey. But I would say the greatest uh, experience I've had is a, I'm a woman and now I'm a bit of an older person, like I said, 10 to 15 years away from retirement. And I have a, I hate calling it, but I, a disability, which I prefer to manage without disclosure. In this most recent case, I was forced to disclose it. And now I don't know what's going to happen. I think my opportunities will be even further limited. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I'm not a woman, but I totally get you on the age and disability part. Yeah. I mean, I haven't been doing it constantly, but I've applied for a lot of jobs in the last almost a year and a half. Yeah. I have heard back from none of them. I haven't received a single interview. Uh, and some of them are, I'm overly qualified for. Oh, yeah. I should correct that. I did hear back from one job. It was a cash job. Yeah. That was the only employer I would hear from. And I was applying for part-time jobs even as well. Yeah. And no one's telling me why they're not hiring me. I'm only left to guess it's because of my age. And I don't mention any disability in my applications. You don't have to. Well, you I don't guess. have to. I, I mean, I'm not... To. If, oh, no, I know I don't have to, but, yeah. um, but, but I'm also not, I'm easily searchable and I'm not True quiet story. about my disability as well. I know. And then proving discrimination is a different story altogether. Of course. Like I stopped putting the year I graduated from high school on my resume probably about 10 years ago because yeah. I was already experiencing then that ageism. I think once we get past the age of 40 and now 50, it's like a totally different ball game so then anyone who is 45 plus unless they know someone it's impossible to get anywhere so either settle for what you have for the next you know 10 to 20 years which really when you at 45 that's still a long time yeah or I mean you just keep trying and keep plugging away at it but like for me I'm not going to settle for less pay I think my value in my experience and life experience too would be of value and worth, you know, a decent salary. So yeah, I totally agree. Like the more if you've been working in the workforce for 30 years, you know, your income should start to reflect that. And maybe that's why they're not hiring people. They don't want to hire someone in their 40s and 50s because they're worried that they're going to have to pay them like $75,000 or more a year or something. No, but I, I don't understand why they're hiring 30 year olds and paying them $70,000 a year. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Course. Yeah, 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 totally. When I was 30, I think we made $38,000 a year. And with inflation, like now, if I think about that, it puts it at about like in today's dollars, about $45,000 a year. I mean, our wage disparity is insane in this province as well. But like 20 years ago, no, I wasn't even making that. I wasn't even making $30,000 a year. So with inflation, barely 40. 
So, and we had four kids. 20 years ago, I was working at the University of Lethbridge in a unionized position and I was making pretty good money. Like mm -hmm. considering I didn't even have a bachelor's degree, I still only had a college diploma. I'm pretty sure I was making over $40,000. By the time I got laid off, I was making over $50,000 a year. And that was last month, I think was 14 years ago. So, so with inflation, probably about 55 now, do you think roughly? Um, maybe even more than that, because it's been 14 years and we had huge inflation two years ago. So, and if I was still there, I'd be making even more than that. I'd probably be, be topping 60, maybe even $70,000. Yeah. But, you know, and I've got to the point now that I'm not even applying for jobs anymore. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, even if it doesn't pay very much. And it's not paid a lot. Like I've lost half of the subscribers I had three years ago. So. Oh, jeepers. It makes it tight. I mean, if I'm not going to get any jobs, it's just, I'm not going to waste my time applying. It's just, there's no point. It's just, get my hopes up and everything. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, the one thing this province is good for is cash work. <laughs> Under yeah. the table cash work. <laughs> yeah. Um, We know everybody does it. The one job that, uh, that I heard back from that was a cash job is just a lot of physical labor. And it's difficult for me to do that right now, so... I can yeah, I, I feel that too. I can't do that either. But just from the research I've done over the last few weeks, um, a lot of companies want to pay under the table. Yeah. They just want to hire contractors. And I, I feel like that's like the latest theme is like do contract positions. You don't have to pay the payroll deduction. Right. And I'm seeing more and more of it in this province anyway. That's the whole gig economy is all about that. That's why it even exists. Yeah. Yeah. I worked for construction one of my first jobs and it was like that. I would just get a check from the contractor that I worked for. Yeah. Every paycheck to just write me a personal check. Yeah. I mean, my son is a flooring installer and he does work with a contractor and gets payroll deductions, but all his side jobs are cash. He just charges slightly less than what a contractor would. And then he it's take home money for him. So yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. My work life is filled with tons of experience tons of disappointments <laughs> a lot of years of trying to and I don't know maybe trying isn't the right word but believing in the possibility that if you work hard enough you'll make your way up exactly when in actual fact that isn't true yeah and it's a bummer <laughs> yeah no I totally get that so now we're where you are now pretty much that's your life story pretty much yeah <laughs> That's quite the story. I appreciate you sharing that with, with me and the listeners. So a question I always ask at this point, and I think you kind of already touched on it, but maybe there's some more you're willing to share, but how has your intersections of marginalization influenced your experiences as a worker? And what I mean by that, ways that your ethnicity or gender or orientation or religion or economic class or ability or anything like that has affected how you've interacted with others in the workplace. That could be customers, coworkers, bosses, whatever. Well, I would say just when I was in leadership, my experience as a single mom, as a mom with kids with disabilities, all of the experiences that I had before, I really was cognizant of what the world was like. And so I actually would try harder to ensure that my staff was looked after taken care of. I never made huge accommodation, but we always had conversations about how to make things better. And now when I'm looking for, because I still help friends out, I get headhunted all the time. I just can't do the hospitality anymore because of the progression of my fibro. But those are questions I ask people when they headhunt me, like, what are you looking for? I know what you're looking for, but what are you looking for in personality, in availability, in what's five years going to look like from now? Like I ask those questions. Hey, you want me right now? Where will I be in five years? Do I have an opportunity to move up at this stage of my life? A real opportunity. Yeah, like a legit opportunity and yeah. not, you know, just something that's $2,000 more a year. That's not, I passed that. But then, you know, even when I would look at resumes and look at hiring people, for me, it was always about a balanced approach. I mean, we all had to fill the, the diversity, inclusion, equality card and make sure that we had balance within gender, within ethnicity. And that was never an issue with me. I mean, I have a global family. You know, I have a couple of brothers who are half Chinese. My granddaughter's father is from India. My nephew is many nationalities. We, he's truly a global child. And so for me, when I talk about ethnicity, diversity, I don't necessarily think that it 
it has to be about what you can see more about how you can integrate yourselves within the work culture that we have and have as much equality in team like environment as possible we've really moved away from that team thing and it's just more about the carnage that is left behind by the competitiveness in the employment world right now is devastating and so when you hear young people saying, I can't find work, I can't find meaningful work, and I can't find work that works with my lifestyle, the world needs to kind of shift properly. And not that we have to accommodate everything, but we need to be mindful of how much more information is out there and how much more people know about other people. And that, you know, all abilities come in different packages. Right. And we shouldn't assign a label to it. Like, how old are you? What color are you? What country are you from? How many languages you, can you speak? I mean, that's useful in many situations. But instead of assigning a label to what you need, how about we just build a team that can fulfill multiple labels and can work together? And we've just really lost that. I think that community and it's more about the individual. I don't know. I think employers are going to spend way more money going forward on recruiting if they don't get it together. I know I kind of digressed a little bit, but <laughs> that's all right. I've got two kids with autism, yeah. one who will need a significant amount of support going forward before he can enter the workforce. And then the other one will need not the same kind of support, but maybe different coaching. And even I was trying to find her a summer job this year. She's going to be 17 this fall and nobody wants to hire her. Okay. Nobody wants to accommodate a 17 year old who right. might have a panic attack because somebody yelled at her. Yeah. Generations are way different now. Totally. I might just have to open a car wash or something and they can all work there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, all right. Any final thoughts for our listeners? I think as Albertans and anyone else who's working in the Canadian workforce, we have to get louder about what the real point of working is so that we can all live, have a roof over our head, food in our bellies, live with dignity and, you know, don't have to go on a big vacation every year, but we should all be able to work and have a living wage without having to work 19 jobs, without oh. having to work 80 hours a week. Like those days are gone and organizations need to figure out a way to do that better as well. I agree with you. And I think there are a lot of workers out there are feeling disenchanted and feeling neglected and forgotten. And yeah, companies are going to have to figure it out or they're going to have a hard time, you know, keeping and hiring people. Well, it's the loyalty factor, right? So yeah. I don't think they're going to have a problem recruiting. I think they're going to have a hard time with retention. Yeah, totally. My biggest thing always is nobody actually leaves the company because they don't like it. They leave because of the management or they leave because of compensation. So they might love the company, but if they ask for a raise and they don't get it and they really need it, they're going to look that salary that they need. Yeah. And they're going to go look for a manager that they can work with. Yeah. And then the company's not going to care because they're just going to pick somebody off the pile of resumes. Yeah, everyone's replaceable. But at the end of the day, I mean, maybe I'm just ahead of my time on this one. And why not hire the 50-year-old worker? Yeah. We've already done the hard part. Like, we know what loyalty means. We're worth the extra salary. We'll stick around. And you're recruiting overhead cost. A fun fact, just in case anyone wants to know, the average cost to recruit somebody and train them. And this is just with minimum wage. Say average training time is two weeks and then you get them past their three months probation. It costs the average company per person that they hire anywhere from $3,000 to $5,000. That's just to get them ready to work. So when you have high turnover, right, and that's front loaded. So the first month always costs the most. And this is on average, and this isn't a hard and fast number for everybody, but this is what people don't know. And the cost to hire and onboard and process one person in the first 30 days is $1,500. Wow. And so if you're having to do that every month because you have a high turnover. You have 10 people a month. That cuts into your bottom line super fast. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate that. That's Good information. Before we finish off, if people are interested in following you and your and your work, is there anywhere they can they follow you? Social media or website or anything like that? I do have Instagram. If they send a message that they saw me on here, then I'll follow them back. Okay. Um, I do have a very low uh, social media profile for sure. lots of personal reasons. That's fine. <laughs> Instagram is one. And what's your handle? 
I think it's just Connie Holzer at Instagram. If you come across it later on, you can just send it I'll to just, me over email I'll send or whatever. it to you Messenger for sure. I can include it in the in the description. And then you said you're on LinkedIn as well. I am. I'm sort of on there. Yeah. Okay. Technically have an account. On LinkedIn and Instagram. No Twitter. That's fine. All right. I'll include those in, in the episode description. Great. Thank you so much. If anybody's interested in following the Alberta Worker, you can find us on social media. We're at Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn as well. Or you can go to our website, albertaworker.ca. And while you're there, you might as well sign up for our newsletter. We have daily, weekly, and monthly options. If you like this episode and the interview that we had with Connie, please rate and review it. And if you want to support the Alberta Worker, visit albertaworker.ca slash support. The Alberta Worker and this podcast are made possible because of the financial contributions of listeners like you. Want to be a guest on the Alberta Worker? Just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on any of our social media accounts. Thank you so much, Connie, for joining us today. Thank you to all the listeners for tuning in. And as always, sorry. Baby.